Natasha Haustoff. Natasha, great to see you in Australia. Welcome to the country. It's wonderful to be here in person. Thank you. Now, this latest clip with Jerry Seinfeld at Duke, this is just a reflection of the anti-Semitism that we've seen right across uh, university campuses here in Australia, in London, in the US. Do you think this has always been there or, or what's driving this? Well, unfortunately, I think it's of long standing. It's in instances like this that we see the mask of anti-Semitism, if it were ever uh, applied, properly slip. Uh, these protests that manifest themselves as anti-Israel are in fact targeting Jewish students on campus and you know, public individuals that are recognizably Jewish. So this modern form of anti-Semitism, which is supposedly acceptable, uh, this Jew hate in the form of anti-Israel sentiment, um, that needs to be called out for what it is. Mm. Now, we've just been speaking about the United Nations vote on Friday, New York time, Saturday, Australia time, where, you know, Australia supported the UN vote. Uh, many other countries abstained, you know, not voting no. What do you think, um, you know, I've said this, that this is giving support to terrorism. You know, this vote wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for October 7. Um, we haven't seen any willingness by any of the Palestinian leadership, whether it's Hamas in Gaza or the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, to actually put forward or come to the table with plans for peace or concessions on Israel's right to exist. Yet the UN has tried to move this resolution. I mean, extraordinary that that should be a concession, the acceptance of Israel uh, continuing to exist. It's important, I think, to be clear that Hamas has been very vocal about using the prospect of a two-state solution as a platform to continue its nihilistic agenda against Israel. And the so-called moderates in the West Bank have been funding the terror salaries for terrorists, including uh, Hamas terrorists and others that crossed the border on the 7th of October. So the notion that there is any partner there uh, for peaceful uh, negotiations towards a two-state solution um, has, of course, been um, utterly destroyed by what we saw seven months ago. What's particularly concerning about the position that Australia has taken now is that it is out of keeping with a consistent policy um, that a negotiated solution is the only proper way forward. And we've seen consistent steps against unilateral moves, even reversing mm. uh, the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Mm. Up until this point, where unilaterally um, voting for this resolution in the General Assembly, we should be clear that this is a political resolution. It doesn't have legal effect. Nonetheless, it sends a particularly powerful message and one that just isn't in sync with so many of Australia's allies, mm. uh, the UK included, mm. uh, who abstained on this, the US who voted against it. Mm. So that is a, a remarkable change and very concerning, as you said um, wonderfully in the opening, um, that one that ultimately rewards the terrorism, brutality and the atrocities that we saw on the 7th of October. Mm. We are seeing um, some international uh, countries accuse Israel of war crimes and genocide. Many figures of the left join in these accusations. As an international lawyer, can you tell us what legal standing they have to make these claims? Uh, well, the claims are baseless um, in terms of legal claims. I would call them political claims, and they certainly fed into the UN Secur uh, General Assembly uh, resolution that we saw. They fed into uh, Security Council resolutions that have been uh, passed. It's important to acknowledge that these also aren't legally binding. Only those passed under Chapter 7 of the Charter mm. um, have legal uh, teeth. Um, but I think what we're seeing is a continuation of these blood libels. I mean, there's no other word for it. These extraordinary accusations that accuse the victims of genocide, mm. uh, the victims being Israelis on mm. the 7th of October, of perpetrating the crimes that were committed against them. And so far as war crimes are concerned, well, we have seen reports both of the United Kingdom government, also of the United States government, that have looked into allegations of breaches of international humanitarian law 
by Israel and that have uh, stated in clear terms that there is an evidence to support them. By all accounts, the conduct that Israel has displayed in this conflict, as in previous rounds of wars in Gaza, mm. um, has been beyond what Western allies could have achieved in similar circumstances. And the death toll, the civilian death toll, much lower even by proportion of the population. Well, the death toll is is a, is a tricky one to interrogate because the only figures uh, that are being repeated uh, consistently by the international media come from the Hamas-controlled Ministry of Health. I doubt that international journalists would be repeating figures from mm. uh, ISIS or Al-Qaeda with the forcefulness that they are uh, parroting these mm. figures. They have not only been shown uh, to have been inflated and falsified in various reports from academics that have interrogated the data. Mm. Even the United Nations has now walked back on some of the claims that it has made with respect to the numbers of women and children. But critically, these numbers that Hamas are putting out do not tell us anything about the civilian to combatant casualty ratio. Yes. And you're absolutely right yep. that the ratio that has been touted of one to one in this conflict is utterly unparalleled in testament to the measures that the IDF take to prevent civilian casualties. All right, Natasha, I'm out of time. Wonderful to have you in Australia. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you.